to look at the market forensically and come up with a plan that was based upon a grander vision. It was, it was actually based upon a grander vision of how civilization evolves, would you believe, that drove this plan. And he, to this day, made more money than anybody I ever knew. And he didn't come from the markets and he didn't sit in front of a screen all day. In this episode of the Traders Improve podcast, we talk to Stephen Goldstein and Mark Randall from Alpha Mind Podcast and from Alpha Are Cubed. And in this episode, we go very, very deep into trading psychology, in the mindset, what makes traders the best traders, what's the difference between the average losing trader and the best traders out there in the world. Lots of great personal stories. Stephen Goldstein and Mark really delivered. It was such a pleasure to have them. So I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you do, leave a thumbs up, leave a comment, and I look forward to hearing from you. And now, enjoy the episode. Hello, Mark, and thank you for taking the time. Hey, good to be here, guys. And um, yeah, this is, first of all, the Alpha Mind podcast the best or one of the best trading podcasts that I've recently listened to. I highly recommend it. All the links, by the way, that we mentioned will be in the video description or in the podcast as well. So really make sure to check them out. And um, yeah, maybe you can first just give us a quick intro so that our viewers and listeners know a little bit of uh, who you are. Yeah, sure. Well, um, I, I started in markets around about 1980 um, and very quickly got into the futures business in London as the London Futures Exchange was about to start. And that was a whole year of sort of really t training around the awareness of what futures trading actually was, because none of us had a clue, because it had never been done in London before. So I, I started on day one on the London Futures Exchange as a trader. And if, if you were on the floor, there was about 300 people on that floor day one. You basically did everything. You were on the phones one minute, you were running the next minute, you were trading the next, you know, it was just busy. But you started to understand about price discovery being down there, you know, where, how prices came, the sense of where flow comes from and what flow feels like, because busy markets have a real feel. And sometimes before a market gets busy, you can feel that there's something coming. And so being on that floor was, was super important for me in, in Without having historically a markets background or a maths background, I started to understand the flow of pricing and, and the movement to the point that I was more of an artist than a mathematician. I noticed that some guys from Chicago came over and started drawing lines on charts and you know, point and figure charts that they were creating as the day progressed, you know, sort of manually. So I thought this is pretty cool. Um, so I started to do it. And because I had this spatial awareness an artistic sort of edge. <laughs> I started to get very good at it. And um, the business, which was NatWest at the time, which was the largest bank in the world at the time, uh, said, look, we're going to move you after sort of two years or so from the floor and you're going to get on a desk. And because clients will benefit from this type of flavor because we've not, pre we've prevented economics and fundamentals before, but we've not really given technical views. But it gave me the ability to look at anything and everything and have a view on it. And that's one of the great gifts of technical analysis that it does give you a feel very, very quickly if you have the right sort of uh, um, education around just the application of it. Um, and then I was on Broken Desk and I was on a Broken Desk right through the period when Greenwich, um, who were a real big player in the market, uh, NatWest bought Greenwich and Greenwich took over the fixed income business of NatWest and we became Greenwich NatWest Futures. And that was, a, that was a really interesting period because suddenly we grew up into this, okay, we're a, uh, we're a quasi American investment bank here and um, attitudes were different, strategies were different, the encouragement to be creative was different. Um, and then that took me right through to getting older in the markets. And as you get older in the markets, I started to do more of sales and marketing and business development and networking and building big business in the corporate world, particularly in the commodity world, using the leverage of <clears throat> the bank itself, uh, which is very interesting. Happened. It was very good progress to still have that markets flavor going on, but also the, the human touch. And within the business, I positioned uh, in around about 2013, just a, a mindset optimization sort of process. Because I, I, back in the late 80s, I had spinal arthritis and um, 
you know, I was getting panic attacks and faint attacks and all sorts of things going on in busy markets. And I was just very uncomfortable having to deal with that. But I found a way um, through some degree of parental guidance and finding some literature of just being able to manage my mindset and become really optimal. And it managed myself sort of from a well-being point of view. So the back was much better managed and I dropped off a lot of drugs as a result. Um, but in business, I was sharper. I was far more accurate. I was more attentive, more, more here. You know, this concept of just showing up for work and showing up for life. And um, this program basically became the most attended non-mandatory training session in the bank's history. Uh, and as a futures broker, I was busier doing that than futures. And as a consequence, they said, look, we're going to give you retirement and you're, and you're in your 50s and you know open up a consultancy we, we want to be your client and then i faced the world in a different way i had the comfort of a pretty big retirement pot so some of that i was trading um but also it gave me this sense of being able to look at what i wanted to do with my experience and apply that to ultimately a market's environment and give people some sense as to well how, how they can get themselves better tuned and, and, and better programmed to take benefit, realistic benefit from, you know, highly fluid, complicated markets that were, that were at times dangerous, uh, dangerous for P&L, but dangerous for their own well-being. Um, and so that's where I am today. And I collaborated with, I reached out to Steve Goldstein about a year and a half ago because I sensed that his sort of behavior finance type background with my, mastery around the mindfulness mind fitness side was a good blend him from more foreign exchange trading myself from trading anything and everything but you know broke into some some of the biggest names in the market was a very compelling mix and of course thrown into a podcast conversation which is where our collaboration comes to life as it were um has been uh, a real revelation for those that have listened you know some yeah. huge numbers of of downloads People queue so up to join. You know? And just while we're speaking, let's get Stephen in here. He is in oh, he's, the, he's, he's come in. in. Yep. So let's just get Stephen right in. Uh -huh. Hello, Stephen. Hello. So I've done me. So maybe you want to do you. Sounds <laughs> <laughs> <That's> good. <laughs> um, okay. So I, I'm a performance coach um, working with risk professionals, traders, investors also beyond that with, with leaderships and man leaders managers and teams as well um, so it covers a, a very broad area um, and as a coach the whole idea of it is to catalyze improvements in performance personal growth personal development helping people to move past challenges and to move on and, and, and become more effective in what they do as a performance coach i work very much on the risk process so it's not so much on strategy or particular tactics, but how can the person be more effective as a risk professional? Before I was a coach, which was, I started working in 2010 as a coach. I was a trader for 25 years, an investment bank trader, worked for banks such as Credit Suisse, Commerce Bank, and, and the banking arm of American Express. Started in 1987, bit of a baptism by fire, it was the week of the, uh, the stock market crash. <laughs> that was my first trading experience. And although I wasn't working in stocks, I was working in uh, interest rate derivatives, interest rate markets, foreign exchange markets. Um, and I stayed in that area, both working as a market maker, working in relative value roles, and then as a propriety trader in those markets. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of uh, insight about who I am. That's great, yes, and thank you again for taking the time. Um, as I said to Mark already, um, I've been binge listening to your podcast. It's, uh, it's amazing, the stories, the wisdom, uh, highly recommended to anyone. And what I would like to ask you, just get started, what are some of the best practices that you see in, in the best traders that you work with? Okay, so in my experience there's there's a term i call letting go and the best traders for me 
a masters of letting go. So uh, just about anyone I've coached will have heard certain stories, which I tell time and time again, which are examples of how people let go, let go of their ego, let go of attachment, let go of their need to be right, um, let go of the ability that lo- of, of the idea that losing is equated to failure, which it isn't. Losing is part of trading. Letting go of unhelpful beliefs, which everyone has, some of them which are unconscious, which is a big part of what I do, which is bringing unconscious beliefs to the surface. Um, and that, that's very much an element of my trading where I try and make what's implicit and unsaid explicit and bringing it into awareness. And then once they can do that, then they can find out whether those beliefs are useful and helpful or whether there's something which they can, they can try and let go of or work on letting go of. Um, and, and I often talk about a particular trader I worked with many years ago who's one of the best traders that I ever coached. He was an investment bank trader and he's, he's now a hedge fund trader. And he was also a big poker player. He was, at the time, he was rated in the world's top 200 poker players. He used to go across. He was based in Hong Kong, so he used to disappear to Macau every single weekend and take part in tournaments. And I was introduced to him as the best, um, the best trader in this entire firm, which was a U.S. investment investment bank. They must have had 200 or sorry, 2,000 traders globally. And I was told that he was the best trader in the entire firm. So one of my questions at the time was, why does he want coaching? And his answer was, because he's the best trader in the firm. If he wants coaching, we'll give it to him, no questions asked. And, and he wanted it because he believed he could always get better, which is almost the, the opposite of what many traders do, where they often think, or their ego leads them to think, they had a finished article. And I was no different as a trader myself. Um, my ego probably got in the way of my ability to grow rather than supported it. Um, he, he had almost no ego. That was a big part of him. He did have, have an ego. Everyone's got an ego. Uh, and he used it to direct him in the best way possible. Um, but the, 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 the question I asked him was, what made you a better trader? Or in fact, what made you a better poker player than all the other people that you meet are highly qualified poker players in the world that you engage with? And he said to me, I walk away better than anyone else. I walk away from the table better than anyone else. I walk away from a hand better than anyone else. I can walk away from an evening that's going bad before I go into tilt. Because at some point he will go into tilt. And it's not easy to walk away from the table when things aren't going well. It's it's probably the hardest thing to do. Um, So so for for me, this is what he said. And I realised that That was letting go. That is what letting go is. And letting go is the hardest part of trading. And it's a skill that I noticed amongst all the great traders and amongst the great salespeople that I meet as well. It's not just traders. It's managers, salespeople, traders. They they seem to have this ability to let go. And I think Mark's recognised this as well with some of the people you've worked, the leaders, Mark, over the years and the salespeople. Uh, Absolutely. I mean, letting go is a difficult habit to acquire for many people because they feel that it, it's sort of slightly embarrassing in a sense. Um, and, and actually it's sort of a sign of weakness, but it's not. It's just part of the circle of process to achieve the goals that you're, you know, that you've decided. Now, of course, just, just adding to what Stephen has said, the answer that I'd give to, to that question, for example, that you've just asked Stephen would be, the best traders that I've seen actually turn up. (laughs) They turn up for the trading day in, in a, in a, in a, in a very calm, aware um, sort of position, you know, really mentally you can, they have a sharpness that, that shows they have a presence that shows and you can tell almost from the way they walk as to whether they're tuned into themselves and ready to trade. And you notice that there's almost like a pride that gets carried, like an aura. If you're tuned in and you're fully aware of this thing called the present moment, and you've managed yourself appropriately from whatever happened yesterday to how you went to bed and how you got up and how you ate, 
And of course, this is applicable to sportsmen as well. I mean, sportsmen that tune in are very, very present to the game today would have been very, very effective at managing what was going on in, in the days ahead of the day where you're going to perform. Of course, uh, trading is a performance that happens every day. So, so the people that have paid attention to that, to themselves, and knowing who their self is and their strengths as well as their weaknesses and really knowing their strengths and advancing their learning about their strengths to get into a flow state, um, I see. But also purpose. You know, people that have got a very big purpose about why they're doing it. Um, one of the greatest traders um, I ever knew, and he wasn't a lamb. Steve often talks about the, the Lambo man. I think one of his LinkedIn feeds talks about that this week. Um, and, uh, you know, but I, I remember this character. His purpose was that he wanted to build a missionary in India. That was his purpose. His purpose that he wanted to help underprivileged children in the Indian subcontinent. And he did it. And that, that remains his purpose to manage that. But he had this purpose that the, the reason why he was focused and being very careful about managing risk and getting the best out of performance was, it, it, it was because he had a very, very um, important purpose for him. It wasn't just about I want a Lambo or I want to buy an island or something. It was a lot deeper. And that meant that his behavior was better tuned to success because of that deeper purpose. Right. It also helps you push through the hard times. You know exactly why you're doing it. You're not as, as tempted to give up because you have this bigger vision. Um, that totally makes sense. And I listened to, um, I think it was episode two on your podcast, which is something like Mental Edges. And you talked about uh, the Hong Kong guy, uh, fascinating story. And I, you mentioned the, the walking away as his mental edge. And I was wondering, this is, um, it's a very fine line between walking away too early from, from your trading day because the good trade may still come around and you may miss it. And then you're actually um, not really capitalizing on your edge and um, walking away at the right time. What is, uh, how do you, How do you get to this place where you walk away at the right time? Is it, or is it just damage control and you just live to fight another day in that and you don't worry about making money back right away? That's, well, it's a great question. It, it, it's, it, it's a little bit of a metaphor. When I talk about letting go, it's, it, we're talking about that individual and we're talking about, I was talking about poker, but I see the same thing with trading. Okay, so I tell a story of an oil trader who I coached a number of years ago, who, brilliant oil trader, I'd worked with him for a couple of years, um, made a lot of money every year, but this particular year, he got into one of those negative trading loops. You know, he'd gone full tilt. He, he was in one of those places where he couldn't buy a winning trade. So having made a lot of money in the first half of the year, Q3 was a disaster. And what had really hurt him was he'd, he'd called the market completely correctly. He'd just screwed up his execution horrendously. Too much risk, cut out at the wrong time, starts chasing the market, gets caught in this pattern of regret and cycle. I don't think there's a trader there who's never been there yet. <laughs> um, so we, we've all done it. He couldn't get himself out of it. And uh, I worked with him on getting himself out of it. He took a week off from the market and he had to let go. He had to completely let go. Now, he burned his P&L for the year. He'd gone back to flat as a result of this process. And he was completely out of sync with the market. So he took a week off, didn't look at the market for a week. We spoke about the issue. We explored it. We... We deciphered it for him so that he was able to completely let go of this issue, which, you know, at the point that we were talking about it, he's beating himself up. He's calling himself, he's like, I'm the biggest idiot in the world. What have I done? This is horrendous. You know, I'm, the, I'm a useless trader. You know, he devalued himself. I mean, a big part of this beating yourself up again, which most traders go through, is the self-devaluation that you do. So, you know, I had to kind of, get him to remind himself that, 
Yeah, he's been doing this 10 years and he's a damn good trader. You know, and, and this is just a slip up and let go of all these false beliefs and come back to get him back on the cycle. Start again. Like Mark said, turn up. He wasn't turning up. He had to turn up every day. He had to move on from where he was. He had to leave that behind. And that's not an easy thing to do. We talk about it like it's the simplest thing in the world. It's not. You know, we've got this horrible part of us that's running through our veins that we hate ourselves when we've had these moments. Oh God, I had enough of them as a trader. You know, sometimes they lasted weeks and months. Um, you had to move on at a point. Sometimes it took another person to do it. I always remember a time where uh, one of my, head, I, I had a horrible six months, lost a lot of money, I was deeply in the red. And my head of trading came up to me, put his arm around me and just went, don't worry, Steve, I believe in you. I think you're going to make this back. And that reminded me that actually I'm quite good. Otherwise, why would he have said that? And I went on this fantastic run. It feels like it was from that day. It probably wasn't. And I just went on this money-making run. Though. My self-belief came back. I started looking at the money. I did what Mark said. I started turning up every single day. And that's what this oil trader did. As soon as we talked about it, as soon as we exercised that trade from his memory, he was able to get back into the right frame in mind, back into a cycle. And the great thing about this story was his final three months of the year turned out to be his best year ever. He made more money in that three months than he made in any particular year. And it, and it wasn't anything that I'd done. I'd helped him. But it's because he always had it in him. He might have had a great final three months anyway. It was just the right time to get into the market. And it started turning up. Do you think that um, being grateful also helps with this healing process of forgetting about what happened before and just showing up again? Yeah, you, you have to have self-compassion. Yeah. That's, if, if that's what is called being grateful, mm. I think so, yes. You know, uh, self-compassion is so important and it's one of those things which we don't like to talk about. It's a bit of a, you know, one of those fluffy words that, People in the trading don't really like. But again, I see it time and time again. You know, we get caught into these negative beliefs, we get into these negative cycles. That's why we self sabotage. Mm. You know, if you can show compassion to yourself, and I think, you know, I listened to your brilliant one you did with Brett Steinberger a couple of weeks ago. You know, I know he's very big into the spiritual side of trading, um, of, of being compassionate with yourself. You know, it, it, that's why. Yeah. I think it's a, it's a very good point you make about being grateful because if you're in a position where you're even thinking about trading the market, clearly life is relatively comfortable, right? I mean, yes. and it, it's being grateful for what you've got and that there's a degree of privilege to be able to be involved in this space, right? I mean, certainly professionally, but certainly for those that have got the money from a Uh, a private perspective, and it's just recognizing the fact that, you know, whilst you might lose a trade, you've still achieved tremendous success to get to where you are today. And having that realistic perspective, I think, is um, it, is that degree of self-compassion. And, and, and without self-compassion, of course, where you um, ask yourself sort of regularly, am, am, am I okay, you know, through this journey of trading and the, the perspective and my attitude and all of that, that if you do work with teams and other people, of course, you, you can't show them any great sense of compassion if you're not shown it to yourself first because it always starts with you having that attitude towards yourself. So, yeah, it's pretty important for all, so all sorts of reasons. And, of course, not just trading, of course, because your attitude within your trading day, if you're not managing it appropriately, you're carrying that attitude back to the family. You're carrying that attitude back to your social environment. And so it, it becomes more than just about the trade. You know, it's the self-management is throughout the, the fabric of life. Mm -hmm. So trading yeah. becomes basically a vehicle to become a better person in all areas of your life, basically, with this practice. Can I ask you, can I throw the question to you, to you two guys? Mm -hmm. um, are there any incidences where you feel you've exercised self-compassion or where you recognize this, this element of letting go. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I had to. Um, also, as a poker player before my trading career, it was super important for me to walk away when I realized that I didn't have any edge. 
um, be it because I was the worst player at the table or because I wasn't in a proper mindset that evening or day. And um, for self-compassion, um, to me, it's the most important thing that I do when um, when I'm having a losing streak, basically where I can't, yeah, as you said, I can't buy a, a, winning, a winning trade at all. Um, I have to snap out of it and remind myself that what I'm actually doing as a job is, I mean, compared to what other people are doing or have to endure, that this is a walk in the park, so to speak. Not really, but kind of, right? So <laughs> so I was just, uh, if I remind myself of that and of everything that I have in my life, my, my great family, my friends, everything, and this amazing life that I'm really um, blessed to live, uh, I truly think so. Then suddenly trading itself becomes um, not that it, like it's a big monster and then it just shrinks back down to, okay, let's do this. Right. So, yeah. Yeah, I think, and I've been struggling in the past a lot with self-compassion uh, compassion, and I noticed the, the need to, to work on this. I noticed I, I started reading spiritual books very early on and then I started to become this aware of this voice in our head, but we are always so hard on ourselves and then I was looking into how, how do you not fix it, but how do, you, how do you work with that? And I found that the more, well, first of all, awareness is obviously really, really huge once you become aware of it. I find on the first, first when I become aware of it, it was really annoying because I was wondering how can you turn this off? But um, I noticed that the more you are aware of it, the more you can actually, the sooner you can intervene, so to speak, and then you can, inter you can, establish better um, thought patterns and this will translate in your trading but also in other areas of your life and i found that the more the more balanced you have as um i think it was no it was mandy our last podcast interview she said she mentioned uh, mentioned with a you need to fill all your buckets in in your life you cannot have all your self-worth derived from your trading and i found that all those practices help and awareness really, really helps with the compassion as well. It's a, and this is something that I want to get later on as well with the ego. I find it really fascinating. How do you actually get to a place where you're not so ego driven? Because this is a journey that I and we have been, we've been to um, peak performance seminars and doing introspective work a lot. And it's a, it's a constant battle because this voice is just, it's just never shutting up. <laughs> it's your other self. <laughs> right yeah. from many uh, other selves. many many layers of other selves chatting right. away and you just hope that the right self is plugged in when you're making these decisions it's interesting when you're talking about letting go and letting go of, as steve said of, of the trade that i guess didn't work and moving on but there's also the physical letting go of, of, of making a point in time where this is where you leave the market and you go back to normal life i think there's ma many people within the world of if, there, if you're a professional, you're almost told, like you start there and you end there and you know, you, you may refer to the market, but you're, you're not a trader, you passed on to another team. But those in the retail side, of course, don't have necessarily have that discipline. And they're gonna be always, always looking and looking and trying and you know, you know and they start in the morning and they, they end at night and go to bed and wake up and do it again. And so letting go of the connectivity to the market to the point where you just need to look after yourself is also really, really important because otherwise you're just going to blow, blow yourself up. Yeah, that's a, I, I found it. And um, it's something you also mentioned in one of the episodes that you went, suddenly you talk about um, you, how you take care of yourself. You mentioned that um, reducing caffeine can have a big impact because it caffeine creates anxiousness, which I can, totally relate to I reduced and completely quit coffee and it made a huge difference. So there are all those little pieces that, that many retail traders overlook. And then you have the chance of trading from your phone, from wherever you are, and you can never unplug. And it's, you're always in this constant loop and it's, it's really, it's a, uh, it's not a good place to be. No, it's a very dangerous place. Um, I think Steve will share very similar stories about people that have forgotten about switching off. It, it, it's uh, um, unique yeah. the job isn't it, it it's yeah. it's the only job where you know if you compare it to anything you know if you talk about poker you you 
you mentioned you were a poker player. Mm -hmm. um, the poker, the game starts and it ends and you don't play outside that. You just compare it to sport. The sport starts, the game starts and it ends. So you have a time limit. You have an off-season. You know, trading is unique. There is no off-season. There is no end other than Friday night, late Friday night, <laughs> till, you know, until late Sunday night. And then there's still crypto waiting on the weekends. <laughs> yeah, crypto even keeps going on the weekend. <laughs> um, it's, it's cured everything now. Um, it's, you know, it, it's, it's total. And I don't think there's, there's anything else like it in terms of, you know, games. You know, if you look at trading as a game, which it is really. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's interesting talking about ego. I was recently watching, you know, I, I, you heard me talk about poker, although I'm not a poker player. I work with a lot of traders who are great poker players as well, by the way, and I think, you know, there's definitely an overlap there. Um, I was watching the Daniel Negreanu um, uh, film a while ago, and in one of it, there was a point where someone was talking about a, a period where he got where, you know, in between his, I think it was his first, um, his first world bracelet and his second one where it was quite a long gap. Uh, and his ego, they said, got too much for him. He got too big for it. And he just couldn't win a game. You know, and it, it, it was that point that when your ego takes control, you're in trouble. Uh, and we all have that. And as we say, no one doesn't have an ego. Everyone does. And I don't believe an ego is a bad thing. You know, you, you need to have some drive, some motivation, direction. I think you've got to make sure that you keep it tamed. Uh, and that, you know, if you have a purpose, it can help tame the ego. Self-compassion can fight the ego. Um, but it's, it's not always easy to keep it in its box. That, that's the only thing I will say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it becomes a, a, an enemy, um, but it also generates enemies as well. So mm -hmm. you're, it generates a behavior impact on others. And of course, you'll get, you'll get a response from that. And those responses are often things that guests play on your mind. You know, you take them to bed with you and you wake up with them and you think, what did that mean when he said that to me yesterday? That I'm a, I'm a free, I should bloody well calm down and you know, stop being such a da 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 da. <clears throat> but of course, if you're trying to do, a, if you're trying to turn up for the trading day, the last thing you want is are these things to be ticking around in your other self having these conversations about these challenges that you face. And ver they're very often generated by the fact that you're not you know, moderating your ego and I guess having all these consequences that you're then having to deal with. It's like another news channel. And, and whilst you're turning up for the trading day, you're, you're physically there, but your brain is tuned into this other news channel, which has just got this dialogue going when you should really be turning it off, you know, and get, getting back to the trade in front of you. So it has its implications. Mm -hmm. I think for me, the biggest losing months are always after my biggest winning months. And I think that's definitely ego related. <laughs> um, it's just really hard to snap out of that pattern. Now I just have a um, rule that when I have a big uh, winning trade or a big winning month, I typically take off a few days and try to fully experience that um, eu um, euphoria maybe is the right word. And then I try to feel it so intensely that it just disappears. And then I get back into trading and that kind of helps. So, yeah. so what you're doing in that sense is you're letting go. You're letting go. So. It, 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 it's got overinflated. Yeah. So the, 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 the balance is whilst you devalue yourself when you lose money, you overvalue yourself when you win money. Mm -hmm. And you think, I know what's happening next. I don't need to work as hard. Because I know, you know, I'm a superstar, I'm a superhero, I'm a market man. I can tell where the market's going by the flick of a finger. <laughs> yes, exactly. That's the feeling. <laughs> yeah. we, we need our own relative strength, strength index, not following the market, but following <laughs> ourselves. <laughs> Good idea. When, when I'm super overbought, I know my ego has gone a little bit too far. I need to wait for it to get down into the 50% territory. <laughs> and maybe, and maybe when I'm a little bit not letting go, and I'm getting to sulk and like you know, dream up these catastrophes, I've got down to an oversold twenty level on the RSI, and I need to guess moderate myself and reset and get myself back up to neutral. Mm -hmm. And I think Steve is quite right. Balance is so important. Yeah, these mm -hmm. extremes are, are, are dangerous for for the same reason, but they're extremes, and we can be in either of those places 
from one moment to the next in difficult market conditions, you know, Think, things are pretty fluid out there. Yeah. But, but if, we've got, if we've got the tool to moderate ourselves to be balanced, then the, there's huge strength in that. We have the agile mindset comes from that. Yeah. What I really like to do is um, I always like to pick up new hobbies or start new activities because it always puts me back in this um, beginner's mindset and shows me that um, in one area you might have a good skill, but in the other you absolutely have, you know nothing. And this, it grounds you a lot, what I have found. And this is what I always, what I like to encourage people as well, to just be experimental, get out of your comfort zone, try something really, really yeah. different. Um, what I recently, What I found is really helpful is do something very different. Like I got into creative activities, which I never did. And it's so far away from trading. And I found it's had such a huge positive benefit. Well, I'll give you an example here. And I don't want you to laugh, okay? Mr. Goldstein, just don't laugh at it. <laughs> it's worse. It's worse. I did 12 weeks of ballet. Okay. <laughs> you should I, uh, not have told me that. I'm sorry, Mark. Right, that's not your math. You can never take that back. <laughs> no, I had, I had this thong that was impossible to wear because you just had to keep your bits intact. I had these <laughs> shoes that were, yeah, absolutely. I, I had black tights for the practice and white tights for performance. But what's interesting, okay, so I was presenting to um, a, a conference, this concept of mind fitness, of course, that, 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 that I purvey. Um, and there was a poem, a Harley Davidson poem that I, I sort of put up there. And it's sort of, you know, if you lived your, if, if you lived your life, life again, you know, what, what would you do? Get out of your comfort zone more often was one of the, one of the, the lines. Uh, and I said, well, what, to get out of my comfort zone, I did 12 weeks of ballet. Now, a board member of that business came up to me afterwards and said, that was really brave to share that. You know, really, really brave to just share that with us because it made it feel real, right? It, we could, it wasn't something that you would have made up. It just felt very, very real. And that's so important to share that, okay? The fact that you took a risk and you've shared it as a risk with, you know, 300 people that you did something that a lot of people will go, no, what did you do that for? But I tell you, it, it is very, very therapeutic. It was also in French. I don't do French. And most of ballet is in French. Um, but interesting, there was me and about 20 women doing ballet. There's some upside to that, of course. Yeah. I had the same experience when I started doing yoga. I had so many prejudices against yoga. Yeah, and I did it. And afterwards, I, I, I thought I should have done this years ago. I missed out on so many, uh, on so many benefits of this. And yeah. It's just, and I think it's also, it's helping with the ego um, concept as well. It's just, you don't uh, take yourself too seriously. I no, it's also this thing that you can have a fixed mindset, yeah, and just do the same, the same, the same, the same, the same, the same, the same. But if you've got a growth mindset, you're constantly trying to push it and do different things and experience different things and share different things. And that's really, really important, I think, particularly for, for people in this type of field where, Actually, you need a growth mindset, I think, to be successful. I think Steve's done much upon the topic of growth mindset, haven't you, Steve? I, I have, yeah. I do love it. But sort of coming back to that point, I felt like that when I first did my, my mindfulness course. And I turned up at a, a Buddhist center in South London. Um, and someone was banging a gong, and I was thinking, what am I doing here? I just hope no one saw me come in here and no one sees me leave. <laughs> it was turned out to be one of the best days I ever did. It was brilliant. <laughs> you know, so, it, it, and I got so much from that and learned so much from that. And that, that's about grounding and humility. You know, what you described, you know, and, you know, quite often we hold on to things because we're not willing to step outside of our comfort zone. We're not willing to change. Um, and then that becomes, how do we grow? If you're not willing to do that, how do you grow as a trader? You know, you, you have to turn around and sometimes say, I, 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 I'm not very good at this. Because that is the start of growing. Mm. You know, I, I had coaching many years ago. It was, well, 20 years ago was my introduction to coaching. Um, 
I was a trader at Commerce Bank in London and I'd been there, for, well, not been there 13 years. I'd been, I was a senior trader. I'd been working for 13 years and we had a new head of trading turned up and he'd worked at Deutsche Bank previously and he wanted to bring in this coach and he felt that I was the person who was probably the most likely person in this room of 200 people to be willing to try something slightly different. And I, as soon as he said it to me, I was like, you're joking, aren't you? Not what's wrong with me? That was the initial, you know, I, you think of coaching as, as something which means you're, you're flawed or you're not good enough or you're not up to it. You know, it's, it's ironically enough in just about any other arena in the world sport, you have a coach because you want to get better. But for some reason in trading, you take it as almost something that's being disrespectful if someone suggests it. And my initial response was to push back, but he twisted my arm and I had it in the end. Uh, and it was the best thing that ever happened to me as a trader. Uh, my performance exploded in the years afterwards. But he took me through a journey into myself. And uh, part of that journey was realising that there's areas of my game which are very, very weak. And, and, and he didn't tell that to me, but he catalyzed the self-discovery of that. And I came out of it thinking, Do you know, what? I'm very good at analysis. I'm really good at finding value. I'm really good at telling where the market's going, identifying direction. But I'm not very good at executing. I'm not very good at the risk process. I'm not very good at putting the trade on, managing with it, staying with it, letting go. I've been good enough to survive 13 years in the industry and hold down some key jobs. But if I'm honest, I was really mediocre. You know, it's more that I'd survived to that point, I think, than I'd been good. And I'd had a couple of highlights, you know, just a few good trades that got me through that moment. After that, I started to examine myself and explore myself and realise, actually, there's parts of this where I'm really not good. And that, that came from that, you know, it takes a lot of, you know, like Mark said, willing to examine yourself and allow yourself to be exposed and to look inside yourself. And I think that's what most people really struggle with. Um, it's not something we're very good at, generally. Do hmm. you think people know how to do it? No. No. I think that's the, the problem, isn't it? People just don't know any process at all. Or oh, well, where, where do you start? How do I get to know me? The first you know? 13 years of my career, I read these every single year, at least once. <laughs> you know? And I read lots of other books as well. And I thought by learning all about this and reading it, it will help me solve my problems. Sorry, I just because we, think some people will be listening, I held up Market Wizards and the New Market Wizards. Um, books. And I, I read many other books and they're on the shelves behind. Brilliant books. You know, there wasn't a book, trading book, which I didn't read. And I learned a lot from them. But I thought well, they were the answer and they weren't really. They were looking outside of yourself, looking elsewhere for the answers. Whereas really, you know, you, you have to look, you know, you have to look inside yourself. And that's when you start realising, actually, I, I, I am I, I was also a bit self-compassionate. I was quite good at it, but I wasn't very good at it. And I needed to become very good at it. And I needed to work on these areas uh, of risk because that is the whole game. No good if you're good at finding a trade if you can't execute it. And make <laughs> it for you. So what do you think about someone that says, um, all my psychological problems could be solved if I just become the best technician out there? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, no comment. Yeah, <laughs> because there are many people that think that okay, all my psychological problems they come from the fact that I cannot read the chart or I'm chart illiterate, and if I just know 100% what's going on the chart and becoming a really good technician, then it should be fairly easy to be to to trade. And I myself, I was of that um, opinion for a long time as well. Now I know obviously it's completely false. Um, it led me in the wrong direction, but I was on that train for a very long time thinking that if I could just figure out the technicals 100%, everything else is not that important. Right? Yeah, it, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's a very attractive idea to be really good at analysis because it obviously is helpful. 
you know, if you can find value, you've got a great edge that you can then exploit. It. It's the exploiting of it. That's the risk side. You know, a lot of people don't spend time becoming good at risk. They, they spend nearly all their effort becoming good at finding value. So risk management, from, as you define it, is basically executing your edge. It's, it's, it's more than that, but it, it, it is, you know, as I say, it's, it's all these aspects. It, it's being able to um, execute the trade. You know, it's, the game is not analyzing a market, finding an idea and making a plan. The game is translating that plan into trades, staying with it, running with it, um, running in the face of adversity, you know, um, not tinkering with it doing what you said you were going to do, holding your nerve at times, um, and then taking the profit. And then, like you say, not being, thinking that the next thing is I'm going to do the next trade because I'm a superstar, but actually holding back, letting go, and then waiting for the next trade to come to you. Uh, not forcing it. There's, you know, it's, it is the mental side, but it's, it, you know, risk is a skill for me. The whole risk process is a skill. And analysis is part of it but it's not the most important part. No, I absolutely agree with that. And I think uh, it's so important to uh, put across this concept of market feel, of, of getting a feel, getting an intuition for, for the market. Um, and that comes from tuning into sort of all, all a wide range of things. Um, and of course, the visuals around technicals are one thing the analysis and keeping it simple is, is, is another method just making sure you've got that clarity but there are other things you know that there's the, the fundamental stories you're reading there's there's that i've seen i've i've seen this before and i i think it feels like we're going to go into this um there's lots of things that make up your intuition um and i think making yourself as aware as of man, many things as possible that drives your decision making is important but of course then stylizing that to the products that you trade because you start to understand that particular products work in certain ways and certain things work better with some products than, than the other and you're only going to pick that up through experience you know so the guys that turn up on day one saying yeah i'm going to be best trader in the world and all the technicals well yeah but you've, you've, you've got to experience the market you've got to go you've got to do the time as it yeah. were it's, it's a skill it's, it's you know it's Like you say, poker, you need time at the table. You can know the value of every single hand going, but you need time at the table, and then you need to go up your levels and play, you know, bigger hands against bigger players, you know, who are smarter and spend more time. You know, that's what training is like. When you turn up in that first year, you know, particularly if you get on a good bull run in a bull market with a bullish strategy, you can fool yourself into thinking you're good. You know, there's a million people out there who've, think in 2020 have started it in the last six months and been on Robin Hood who, who think they're, you know, God's gift to trading um, because they've had a great run, you know, but their big drawdown is waiting for them, unfortunately, and they have to have it, you know, and, and I had some guests on my podcast. Um, I go back to Adam Nash who says, You've, you find what a good trader's like when they come back, come out of a drawdown. That's when you find what a good trader is, not how they are during a bull run, which is following a system. I love that. Yeah. Right. And um, you did uh, a podcast where you talked about your 15 principles, um, which I found really, really amazing. And there are, there are one principle where you said um, you need to find a system that fits you. And I, I totally um, think that is absolutely valuable. But for new traders, um, how do you approach this finding a new system without getting stuck in this loop of constant system hopping? Because at one point you just need to, you need to settle, I guess. I, I've seen many, many traders who've been there, who have been trading for years and years, and they just can't stop trying to hunt for the next best thing. And um, how, do you, how do you approach that? It's a little bit like what I said before about looking outside yourself all the time. You know, you have to look inside yourself a little bit and start working on who you are. You know, it's not the system that's going to make you money. It really isn't. It's it's a little bit like technical analysis. You know, it's your ability to apply whatever system you're using, and you're fooling yourself. 
by jumping to systems because you have to work on yourself. It's all about you. You know, it, it, it's that there's some quirk within you. You know, we all have it. You know, we're all human. None of us are perfect. You know, we all have these unconscious beliefs. You know, we're all brought up learning beliefs. You know, I, I talk about, you know, when I coach people, I talk about their past a lot of the time. You know, what were the beliefs that were imbibed in them at a very young age and that they, they're not even aware of them until we talk them out. Um, and, and I tell a story of a trader who, um, uh, who I worked with at an investment bank many years ago. Who I, I was told by his, his manager that, you know, look, this guy's really smart, really good. He's got a great head on him. He understands the market. Um, he comes in, though, every year with mediocre performance. And what he meant by that was he, he was hitting his target, working in a bank, in FX, in an in a investment bank. You know, it's not that hard to hit your target. You know, you have enough flow and enough noise and information around you that mediocre performance is hitting your target. But he said to me, I think he can do so much better. I think there's so much more. So could I work with him? So I, I worked with him um, over many months and, and I got to understand him. And, and I could hear why his manager said he's so good. You know, he has great ideas on the market, you know, but he might give that idea to somebody else and the other trader will make a lot more money than him with it. So he never quite backed himself. He never quite had the confidence in himself to go with what he was doing. And as I got to know him, I, I heard a lot that was unconscious in his language. And it was around things like, he's not really worth it. You know, he, he, was, he was a young lad, working class background, mm. um, hadn't been to university like a lot of the guys around him in the investment bank. Um, came from a poor working class district of London. So he never quite, quite felt what he deserved. You know, I feel there is something about the class system in the UK where you don't quite believe yourself if you're from a, a, a working class background, whereas the, you know, the people who've been to the, the good schools and that, they, 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 it's kind of, it's drilled into them. You know, you are the best, therefore you deserve the best. And we have the other way around. Once I, he became aware of that, and I said, this is part of his language and it's part of his, it, it's part of the, the unconscious beliefs that's driving him. And, and, I, and I, I showed him how good he was through the traits he talked about. He started believing in himself. It was that simple. And he started making money. He started holding his trades for longer. He started putting more risk on. He started managing every part of his game much better. And, and within a year, he doubled his P&L. And then the following year, he got put on a management course. And, and then he became the global head of trading for FX. Um, for Europe, Middle East, and Africa, and still is. Uh, and, and that's a story I've, I've played out many, many times with traders. You know, if, and, and that's kind of this, you know, when I go back to devaluing yourself, you know, those beliefs we have can often devalue ourselves in some way. So learning about yourself and who you are internally is for me a vital part. And I hear it, you know, I hear people talk about that with sports stars. And I think, Mark, you've got some stories from your your back cataloging that I've got I've got a hell of a story to tell you and it's exactly this this man had never traded the market before okay and he t turned up as a, as, as a client um, and we at the time had a new charting system called ADP Comtrend that back in the day we're talking about early 80s you had to take the, a photograph of the screen and it printed out on this really expensive paper that was about 80 quid a roll which is about 500 quid a roll in, in today's money. Anyway, so I was given this instruction to, Mark, I need to look at these markets. I need you to send me hourly bar charts for these markets going back five years. So that was, a, that was per day. So every day was an hourly chart on this screen. I had to print off, right, for these four products, five years of back, charts basically that were just images printed into this silver stuff i i i reckon i was getting tapped on the shoulder saying mark you still you got like five inches of print out <laughs> you're still going and it was costing the business like about 500 quid to send all this stuff out to this fella but this this fella had never traded before 
but he had a plan, right? And he had a sense as to how he, how he was going to take advantage of this market by applying this plan. And he was looking literally every day, just looking at what was going on and how it went on within these products. And his conclusion, I think, is, and, and that's, the conclusion was that he became a trader. And, and I don't, and I think he'd have been very, very close to Jim Simons in terms of profitability. He made huge amount of money, okay, with, because he had a process. And I'm still, I still know that system from, from because he basically, I, I was running it whilst he was at home doing, just counting money. Um, but his philosophy was that the market, whilst it was directional, was one thing, but the market vibrates. So within a day, it, it, it goes through several price points several times. Um, and he wanted to take advantage of that vibration of the market. The fact that he may be buying now and selling there, but he'd be buying again down there and selling that back here. And he had a plan and he had process around it and he had a stop loss program that sat behind it and was very, very rarely triggered. And he was printing so much money, it was, it was ridiculous. But it was about him having put the footwork in to look at the market forensically and come up with a plan that was based upon a grander vision. It was, it was actually based upon a grander vision of how civilization evolves, would you believe, that drove this plan. And he, to this day, made more money than anybody I ever knew. And he didn't come from the markets and he didn't sit in front of a screen all day, but he worked out a plan and he printed stupid amounts of money. And I was the bloke doing all the work. Uh, Pointing up again, oh, by the way, yeah, you made this, 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 this overnight. Yeah, fine, off you go. He'd done nothing. And <laughs> it was ridiculous. Yeah. It, to the state, it was ridiculous, but it's because he paid attention and he bothered to forensically look at the market and put that time in to understanding how a market moved before he traded it. And that is really, really fundamental. Right. Yeah. What a story. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In one of your podcasts, you mentioned, uh, and I want to be mindful of your time. So um, I know you're running uh, late, I think, but in your podcast, you mentioned there are many ways of mental edges. Uh, many different, or there, there can be different edges. Uh, one of the edges you refer to is the ability to walk away, which will help you in the long run. Are there any other, because I find it very inspiring always to hear about what other people, what are their strengths and what helps them get to, um, to a place of probability. What have you seen um, your traders have with regards to other edges? Well, Shall I give a few examples, Stevie? Yeah, so he's just on mute at the moment, yeah. So let, let me just share some of mine. I'm sure Steve's got some too. Sorry, um, I was on mute then, so carry on. <laughs> There's noise, noise going on outside my room, so I just turned it on to mute. Yeah. No, but well, let me just share some of, of, of the ones that I've found. It's the ability to reset, refresh, recalibrate yourself during the course of a day and understanding you need to have this almost these little step aways, this little step away from actually being at your, your workstation. And ironically, some of the best, and this is a bit contentious, I must say, but some of the best traders I've known were actually people that smoked. Be because three times an hour, no matter what the market was doing, they'd always go outside and have a cigarette. <laughs> they'd have a break. And 10 minutes later, they'd come back. And yet they'd come back and they'd have this sort of degree of focus because they'd taken this break. And it's a little bit ironic that, you know, people that were smokers were actually doing things that we should all be doing. Just paying attention and putting these pauses in, putting these little moments where you just connect with, you know, the open environment and get fresh air and whatnot or, or, and broadband light. Um, and, and then go back to do your job. Yeah, and, I, and an awful lot of people, certainly in, in the early days, uh, were, were, were smokers. Um, but I still see it, see it today that there are people that are smokers that actually, you know, 
don't feel scared and get saying, I'm just popping out for a cigarette. Right? And no one says, well, you're not. But the rest of us sit there blindly and like, you know, wow, we're doing our job, doing our job. But we should all be thinking about taking these little breaks, little and often during your day is really, really, really important, particularly in difficult days. And sometimes in a job, I know it's very difficult to step away, but you're looking to manage yourself here at a fundamental level of you. So you should make that time to think, I guess I need to step away from this. I'm, I'm not seeing clearly what's going on. I need to go and walk around the garden and get some fresh air, you know, and just get myself settled and balanced, you know, and, uh, and, and reset and refreshed and recalibrated to then face, you know, another mini session. So it's almost in the dialogue of a trading session of a day. Just consider it to be lots of little trading sessions. And in between the trading sessions, you're managing yourself with, you know, with the various toolkits of, of, of getting present and getting fresh air or even just going for a walk and tuning into the walk itself rather than the last trade that may have failed. That process is very, very important. As much as, Rolf, you were talking about the caffeine, you know, watching what you eat is incredibly important and, and drink. You know, if you're anxious and nervous about something, caffeine will just totally um, do, the, do the bad thing. If you, if you check out spiders, NASA, caffeine on Google and see what caffeine does to spiders trying to build a spider's web, you, you, you get really, really worried about what's, what, what caffeine is doing to us because I think we share, share about 60% of our DNA with spiders and um, uh, plants generated caffeine to be a poison for things to stop them attacking plants and yet we're drinking it all day long. So those types of things, keeping yourself hydrated. You know, this, this brain on top of our head, you know, if it, you know, it's 70, 80% water. And if you think of about the weight of water, if we start losing water, this is losing water before anything in your body because of the, the weight of it. So hydration, you know, people that pay attention to their, their health as well as, because actually those type of things drive your mental well-being. You know, the, what you drink, what you eat, how you eat, how you pause, how you hydrate how you get fresh air and have access to fresh air. Super vital. If you strip it down to the fundamentals, your cognitive ability at a fundamental level depends on all those things as well as the ability to wind down and rest and sleep well. So you can have as much mindfulness going on as you fancy, but if you're not paying attention to those structural foundations of, of you, then you might as well not bother. So that's where you have to start. You have to start, okay, I need to just manage myself from this commitment from now on that if I want to trade better, okay, I can have the best trading strategy in the world. But if I'm not managing myself in a way to get myself optimal and really, really sharp, then, you know, I'm on a losing wicket, as we say in cricket terms in England, <laughs> straight away. <laughs> you know, you might as well not bother because your, your edge is... You know, you're, you're, you're trying to fight to catch up with where your edge is because you sort of lost it in the whole process of your preparation of you. Yeah. We forget, people forget that. I think Mark said it all, don't it? You know, this job is 100% cognitive. You know, it's not about intelligence. It's about cognition. It's about the mind. It's about the skills of the mind. You know, you, you are the special forces of the financial markets, in a sense. You know, and... and I know this because on a podcast we've got coming up soon with um, with a coach who's also a neuroscientist, she talked about analysis which has been done which shows that traders have the same mental um, attributes as special forces, soldiers and high performance athletes. They're the two closest um, comparisons. A and if you think of a special forces soldiers, they are elite. They are the best of the best. You know, they, they when they need to be, they, they turn up, as Mark said earlier on. And it's, you know, you need to be at your very best. Now, you need to be at this all the time, and you can't. You're, you're not humanly capable of being on the ball, on point all the time. And this is probably, I think, more of a point for people who do short-term trading, perhaps than longer-term trading, because that is so energy-sapping. 
you know, um, to be able to get in front of your screen at seven in the morning and be at your best in terms of making decisions till five, six, seven at night, it, it just cannot happen. You would not be at your best. Um, and there's some research done a few years ago which looked at decision making. Uh, they looked at judges, parole board judges, as the uh, you might have. But you've seen this research? Yes, and that after this research, I started scheduling all my important doctor meetings in the morning <laughs> or right after lunch. <laughs> Absolutely, and I, I, I worked with. I did it actually. I, I did the psychometric analysis. One of my colleagues coached. Uh, a trader at a hedge fund um, who was a very nervous, wary type. But he was also brilliant at day trading. He was a day trader, which is quite uncommon in hedge funds. Um, but that was his skill. That was where he was best placed. He didn't trade after one o'clock. He ran no risk after one o'clock because he had no edge. You know, you, you talk about being at the table when you don't have an edge. But if you're at a table when you don't have an edge, everyone's taking your money, okay? And it's the same as being at the screens without an edge. You're losing. You know, nine times out of ten, you're losing. So don't be there when you don't have an edge. He doesn't have an edge after one o'clock. He's spent. His energy is gone. He does his other work, comes in the next day, starts again. Um, what, you know, too often I've seen traders who have a very good first hour And then they spend the rest of the day giving their money back. And, and, and they're not even conscious of it. And, 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 you know, many years ago, when I read this research about the, the judges, I, I suddenly remembered what my trading was in the 90s when I was a day trader. Now, I was, I was, when I was at a bank, my style was mostly day trading. And in the morning, I used to trade. Are you, are you equity traders, futures traders? Rates, FX, I haven't asked yet. For me, um, FX, uh, active day trading and swing trading. Okay, and Raf? Yeah, I'm very, we trade very, very similar. I'm a little bit more, a little bit longer, but not much longer time frames. Okay, so, so I was mostly interest rate futures, bond futures. I used to do those in the morning. In the afternoon, I would do the US dollar equivalents. <laughs> Euro dollar futures, 10 year notes, that sort of stuff. Now, I was always making money in the morning on my Deutsche Marks. That's how long ago we're talking about, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, and always losing money in the afternoon on my dollars. And I just thought I was a bad dollar trader and I just didn't get a dollar market. Now, later on in my career, I started trading more longer term, sort of swing trading, you know, one, two, three week positions. And that balanced out. I started making money irrelevant because they were similar economies, similar products, similar economies. There's no reason why I should have been making money constantly in one and not the other. So when I wasn't day trading, but was these two even now? And it, only when I read this research did I realize, yeah, I was, you know, I would only do a few trades in the morning when I was very disciplined, very controlled. In the afternoon, I had this long list of trades because I lost all discipline and control of myself. <laughs> and, you know, it would be like five trades in the morning, 30 in the afternoon. And only on reflection was I doing that. Interesting that you say that because also for me what I found out when I'm in Asia for example in the Asian time zone my trading results tend to be better than when I'm in the European time zone because when I'm in Europe I have to get up and immediately be present and make my decisions when London opens and when I'm in Asia I have the whole morning to myself I have lunch then I relax for an hour then the market opens I'm in a completely different mindset and that's such a huge impact on my edge that I'm more profitable when I'm in Asia. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I saw some data from FXCM a few years ago, and I'd love to try and dig it out, where they analyzed all their traders on the FX market's performance by currency. And in nearly every currency, the traders, and they were retail traders mostly, were making money, or on average were making money in the first couple of hours of the day, on average lost money the rest of the day. And if it was Aussie dollar and yen, they were making money in their time zones because when that was mostly traded uh, and it, it was fascinating and it was like, you know, really, if I was day trading, I should just trade the first two or three hours and then disappear for the rest of the day, play golf or yep. go to the gym or living the dream, <laughs> living the gym. But it kind of makes sense though. Yeah. You know, I, I, there's one guy and I only trades the open and the close 
that is it. That is all he trades. He, he doesn't disappear for the rest of the day. He analyzes the market. He needs to get that data to know, to be there for the open and close, but he doesn't trade anything outside of that. And that, that's masterful. That's your edge. Just trade it and don't trust the rest. Trade the rest because you're just giving money away. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that makes total sense. <clears throat> but it's also just a little connection because you said earlier about guilt and you come from middle class and I've seen a trader or two that I talked to and I said um, they feel guilty to some degree if they just work like a few hours in the morning and then they look at their parents who worked all their lives from nine to five and it's a... Um, It's, uh, it can be, I think, very burdensome or very challenging internally when you're not aware of it, where this is. And then it leads to self-sabotage, obviously. So it's a, it's a fascinating area, I think. And for everybody who's interested, I will put the link um, to your podcast where you talked about the parole officers and the judges to the research. I'll put it in the link in the, the video description. It's absolutely fascinating and uh, totally makes sense, yeah. I, I didn't realize I'd put that in, if I put that in a podcast. Yeah, yeah, I, I listened to it, I think, uh, just today or yesterday when I was walking my dog. Yeah, We've done so many, it's become a blur. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I want to be really mindful of your time. I really appreciate it. It was so much fun picking your brains. Um, so maybe you can let our audience know where they can find you and how to connect with you. Okay. Um, right, so, uh, well, we, we, the Alpha Mind podcast It's, it's a joint production between myself and Mark. We both got our own businesses and then we both do some work together, um, which comes under the, the bracket of Alpha Mind. Um, so it's alpha-mind.net is the website. The podcast is called the Alpha Mind Podcast. Um, we've got an Alpha Mind group on LinkedIn um, and we, both connect, we can both connect with LinkedIn. Um, my business is called Alpha R Cubed. Um, which is specifically around coaching, personal development. Uh, it's not just trading and financial markets. As I, as I say, I do some work in leadership um, with, with HR businesses, uh, teamwork, that sort of thing. So it's not exclusively about financial markets, but it's predominantly. And then Mark's got his business, and he also, I think maybe you could tell them a bit about that, Mark. Sure, yeah. It's, it's a consultancy-based business that um, really... Uh, drives itself around the outcomes required by the client. Um, we have a, a, a very broad toolkit of, of process that can be applied to various um, businesses and people within markets particularly. And that ranges from sales right through to trading and, of course, leadership and executive and everything in between. So and my business um, landing site is www.markrandallconsultancy.com. Our collective site, I think alpha-mind.net, alpha, alpha I think has links to both of our worlds and, and the various Twitter um, feeds as well, as well as obviously the, the LinkedIn. So, um, yeah, it, it's, a, it's been an intriguing story. We're still best of mates, so, uh, and we're looking forward to a very rosy future of continued development because I think as you guys have found, of course you, you wanted us, and we're, we're privileged to be on your channel, that... I think you've realized that there aren't too many folk out there that have got 70 years financial markets experience between them, but also sort of know, have mastery around the behavior side and, and, the, and the cognitive side of, of dealing with all of the challenges, both personal and professional, that markets throw at us, uh, much of which we covered today. So we're very, very grateful for that as well. Perfect. Thank you so much. And all the links again, wherever you are consuming this will be under this video or the podcast. So you can check that out. Thank you again. And uh, hopefully for round two at one point. Thank yeah. you so much. <laughs> Absolutely. Look forward to it. Well, whilst we're still on, I, I, I was of the belief that we were, I was going to also put this on our podcast. I don't want to jump across you if that's not the case, if I've misunderstood mm -hmm. that. Oh, totally. Um, I'm still recording, but I can cut it off. But uh, yeah, I can send over to you the, the raw video. And then you can put it on your YouTube or your podcast. I can send you both the video and the audio. And then you can use it um, how you want. Yeah, totally. Are you okay with that? Yeah, yeah, no, no problem. Yeah. Totally. Okay. If, if that's we did it the same. We did it with Mikey Bellafiori, uh, Bellafiori and Dr. Steenbarger. They put it on their channel as well. That's all good, yeah. Okay, if that's the case then, can, 
our audience find out about you two and where they can learn more about you? <laughs> sure. <laughs> da, da, da. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Yeah. So you can find us on our website. It's tradesociety.com. Um, on Twitter, it's tradesociety. Uh, Moritz is tradesocietymc on Twitter. And on YouTube, it's Trade Society as well. So yeah, it's pretty, pretty simple. Uh, so you can find us everywhere, connect with us, reach out. Yeah, we are always there. Yeah. And, and, just... and a little bit about what is Trade Society? What is its purpose? Um... Oh yeah. Trade Society is um, four years old now. Close, four years? Yeah, you know? pretty much, yeah. Four or five pretty years. Four years. And uh, it's basically a community and an educational website, mostly centered so far around technical analysis. Um, but now, right now we are shifting into mindset, psychology, performance, uh, mindset, uh, growth mindset, stuff like that, because, um, we also found out over the years that, um, you can only do so much technical analysis and then it's pretty much done. And we don't, didn't want to do the 100th support resistance video <laughs> and, um, well, we found out that the path to fulfillment or that if you want to have a path through trading to fulfillment, you need to be working on your path to greatness as well and your mindset. So that's what we are doing on trade side, you know, and uh, we are both also full-time traders and um, having a good time so far. <laughs> Fantastic. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, I'm glad we answered your questions in the right fashion then because I think we takes all of those boxes of uh, <laughs> the reason why we're doing this. Yeah. Exactly, Not yeah. just to make money. There's something bigger <laughs> going on. Fantastic. We, we feel a little bit, how would you describe it, Mark? That, that there's something that's the passion for doing this. There's a little bit of mission as well. Um, I so, yeah. It's a, I guess a, yeah, the, a wake up call and awakening that comes with it. There's a lot of people here who, who are going into this to try and make a career for themselves, trying to build a family and, and want to be able to support the family, want to stand on their own two feet. They don't want to work for people. They want to be independent. Uh, and markets are a fascinating puzzle. Um, and, and we find that there's a lot of bad information out there. There's a lot of misinformation out there. There's a lot of people marketing rubbish and I, I don't mean that um to try and put them down but they're just salespeople who have never spent a single day behind a trading screen or had to deal with one of those market pullbacks that's ripped a very stomach from, <laughs> from deep inside their mouth and pulled it out uh, and therefore how can they educate people and how can they sell their services so so for a sense you know, there's a sense that I think people need uh, proper education and resources that tell the story as it is, rather than try and sell a dream and an illusion. Yeah, well, we, have, we have a responsibility, I think, in that sense. Mm. So we have a responsibility in providing authentic, appropriate guidance advice, training, you know, sound bites, experiential storytelling. We have this responsibility to share that because it's not being done appropriately out there. And the other message that I, w I would add to, to this is that if you are trading and you're setting, you know, stops and things like that, don't, the, don't risk more than you, than you can afford to lose. Okay. Don't risk more than you can afford to lose. Just That's balance, just understand advice. that, you know, put a little bit on because you can afford to, if you, if you can't afford to lose the amount of money you've got at risk, you shouldn't be trading. 100%. Especially during those times where there's just so much uncertainty in the world. It just, all the stress comes on top of, from off everything and then it's, uh, yeah, well, it is 2020, and the last thing we, we haven't had really is uh, asteroid impact approaching, which uh, <laughs> would really mess us all up. So, <laughs> famous last oh, words uh, by Randall. Yeah. So, pay would still go up, you know. <laughs> Someone would make money. <laughs> it's, just, it's, it's, it's a point which I, I just want to sort of add in there. Um, it's a point I've dwelt on recently a, a little bit with some of my tweets. Um, 
that, that people go out there with, with their risk management completely skewed. You know, they set themselves ridiculous targets of, can I make 10% a day or 20% a week or, you know, and they're willing to sit there with drawdowns of 30% intraday. And they just set themselves up to fail because they're just so unrealistic in terms of their target. You know, and I recently had a conversation with someone where I pointed out that if he could just grow his capital by 0.2% a day, that may not sound like a lot, but he'll be a millionaire and a multimillionaire by the end of his career if he can compound that. Yeah. And, and, you know, have realistic targets. You know, that 0.2% a day works out at nearly 60% a week, a year rather, if you compound. And if you can make 60% a year, you know, you're in Jim Simon's territory. Right. Exactly. Yes. That's what I always tell our uh, members in the masterclass as well. You don't need to, to have those ridiculous numbers. Go for one, two percent on average per month and you're going to have a long, uh, long and healthy trading career. Um, also, if you see trading as a vehicle for self-development, your short-term results are also going to improve. And that's the, that's the thing that people have to get, I guess. But it yeah. takes a long time. It took uh, me a long time to get it. Try to have fun on the way. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Expect. Yeah. Those negative, those unrealistic expectations, they are so bad on many different areas because it eventually it will cause frustration because those expectations they won't be met often or at all, and then you burn your emotional capital, and then at one point those traders either give up or first they will blow up in a big way, and it's a uh, Yeah, managing expectations, I think, is something that is not often talked about because it's not a very uh, sexy topic, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's really, really important. Yeah. Mm. You don't want to get to 85 years of age and somebody asks you, what have you done with your life? And you go, so I sat in front of these screens <laughs> trying, to, trying to make bloody money every day and worried myself sick. Yeah. You don't want to be having that conversation at 85 years of age. Yeah. Yeah? You don't want to be looking back and like, all I did was stare at these screens and tried to make money. Good point. Yeah. You know, you've got to have a better perspective on life is, is so important. Right. Yeah. I think that's a good, that's a good word, uh, a good way to end this uh, podcast. It's been absolutely a, a pleasure. Thank you so much again for, for um, being here and spending your time with us. And uh, yeah, until the Fantastic. next time. Fantastic. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. All best. Take care now. Thank you. Bye. Bye.